so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm glad everyone was able to make it. Hopefully uh, everyone gets to leave here today with some more knowledge about opening up their own self-core tap room. Uh, I was just talking to Jody and them that came in from Texas, which is awesome. Uh, but uh, about, you know, my experience in, in working with every all these entrepreneurs and going from the idea to the, you know, the struggles of finding a place to the, you know, to the, the other hurdles that I'm sure Tim will share with you, but then seeing it come to fruition. And, you know, two and a half years later, uh, this location just, you know, doing great and, and learning and growing and adding new things to it. And it's, I just get such fulfillment out of seeing every project come to fruition and every entrepreneur kind of use uh, something that I just had in my head to build a whole business around. So it's, uh, you know, the spotlight is definitely on Tim today. It's not on Pour My Beer. I, uh, I hope, hope all you guys, it's more of like a fireside chat experience, but uh, Tim's story is, is very similar to a lot of our customer stories and, and the fact that, you know, didn't have any hospitality background at all prior to this, but uh, you know we, we got to know each other a lot during the the, uh, the I guess uh, prospecting phase. Uh, him and his partner Eric, uh, you know, we we meet at different breweries and we met you know at our office the first time I think, yeah. right? So uh, yeah. yeah, I mean we the, the general outline is you know I, I wanted Tim to kind of go through some of the the different stages and uh, you know Tanya I guess can facilitate or you know. Since it's a pretty intimate crowd, you can just kind of throw a question out if there's something that he says, and just maybe raise your hand or something. And you know, the goal is that you're 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 learning from uh, mistakes that you know we've collectively made uh, to help your experience be a memorable one and a, and a good one as well. So uh, I guess uh, I'll pass the stage to Tim, and, and we can kind of Tanya. Did you want to go through the different stages, or how did you want to do that? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Tim, if you want to give him a little bit of your background prior to having your tap version. Sure, yeah, I mean, um, first of all, you know, I don't know how much you know about Josh Goodman's story with how he got into this field in the beginning, but I mean, you know, he's been at it now for seven, seven years or something, and I mean, the ups and downs, trying to figure out new technology, coming up against roadblocks in every state, um, some of the setbacks and some of the highs and lows. I mean, he like really pioneered this. Uh, the other options out there are really bad uh, for self poor. So like, for me as an entrepreneur, I I genuinely am thankful that Josh went and did all this stuff so that I could open this, which is for me a, a dream uh, project, you know, and it's been an incredible experience. So. Um, you know, in a sense, thank you for taking yeah. the taking the bumps and bruises. And that was uh, I, I brought a few of my bumps and bruises with me. There was uh, <laughs> really yeah, uh, we brought we've been replacing a lot of our competitor systems lately. And this is I brought this to Tim because Tim has a very unique knowledge of our competitors because just like anyone in the industry, they're they're doing their research. So uh, we've replaced about 80 of these screens in the last uh, like two weeks and. You know, when, when, when I partnered with the group out of Austria to build our own technology, it was because I actually resold this technology for a good, you know, year. And I, I was the one going to the, you know, the Marriott's and the other locations, you know, replacing these. And, uh, you know, when you build something that's built for longevity and stability, like these, I mean, uh, Tim will tell you, these, these were installed two and a half years ago. There might have been one or two screens that we've had to replace, but nothing anywhere close to like this. Um, so, you know, I, I don't mind to take the bumps and bruises. I feel like it's, uh, you know, it's definitely made, made me more aware of, of the weaknesses of other companies when, when you're reselling them. But, um, yeah, so I guess the, the first uh, section was kind of like the business plan and, and picking the right partners. Uh, you know, I told them a little bit about your partner, Eric, but maybe if you want to give them a little bit of a, an idea of how that idea started, Eric's background and kind of how how you guys came up with this sure. concept? Well, you know, the self tap taproom uh, has a, a beautiful thing because you can be outside the industry. You don't have to have run a restaurant or a bar to enter the industry because the self tap taproom is a little bit more streamlined and you can, um, as an entrepreneur, get access. Whereas before this, um, I, I would have probably never opened a bar or a restaurant. Uh, I, you know, I came across Selfport Taproom, PourMyBeer.com, and I was like, that's something as an entrepreneur that I could actually get into. And so, you know, that's amazing that it lowers the barrier to entry 
for entrepreneurs that don't have 20 years of experience running a restaurant. Um, partners, you know, look, it's a double-edged sword. You know, there's people out there that say, don't partner with anyone you know, no best friends, no family members. Uh, if you can do it, do it on your own. Um, you know, there's outlaws, there's in-laws. Um, you know, that whole perspective. And, you know, I get it. Look, a lot of partnerships don't work. The majority of them fail and they separate. Um, so you have to be really careful, like, who you're actually partnering with. Um, that being said, like, if you can have a partner, two people with different skill sets sharing the load during this, it's not a short process. You're talking about a two-year cycle from thought to concept to, you know, launch. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think I could have done it without, um, you know, my partner, and he couldn't have done it without me. We were able to have that dynamic synergy. He is the technical guy. He is the systems guy. He's able to, you know, code for me. I'm the people person. I can manage a staff. Everyone feels comfortable around me. So I, I create a fun, warm, welcoming environment. And that's what you need, that kind of balance between partners. So I've had, like, the best of both worlds, um, someone who's totally different than me, and it works. But um, I would say be careful. Um, because you could pick the wrong partner, and it, uh, it's not fun. And when you guys were looking for locations, uh, which I think some, how many people here are looking for locations right now? Anyone? Okay. So when you were looking for locations, I remember this very specifically. Actually, Duncan was with us the one meeting. Um, uh, what were some of the, like how many locations did you look at? Sure. And then how did you know this was the right location? Yeah, I mean, you know, I would, you know, you hear the saying, location, location, location is everything. Uh, it's true. Uh, here, looking around Chicago, obviously there's hundreds of locations you can look at, and we looked at over 150 locations over a year and a half. Um, some of you are, are not from a massive market like this, so your market, there might be less, which is, I think, better. Um, for us, we actually were convinced that there was not a place for us, and we were going to walk away from the project because we couldn't find a location that we knew would be successful. And you have to have that perspective, like, all right, if I can't find a place that is like a really thriving location with foot traffic and nightlife, then it's not worth doing. Because, you know, if you're just in a strip mall where they have to drive to you, it, it, there's a good chance it's not gonna work. You need some, uh, you need that uh, critical mass of people in nightlife areas, Friday, Saturday night, to make it work. And so uh, we, we searched and searched, Finally, we found this. This was one of the last locations we looked at. We always wanted to be in Logan Square. There just wasn't a lot of good options. There was a lot of uh, rectangle bars like the one across the street available, long, dark rooms where the beer wall would not be showcased. Number two, no one knows what's in there. It's so dark. Number three, the section of where people could sit or uh, go to the beer wall is so thin, it's claustrophobic. So we passed up 20 of those. And we bid on some of them, and we're so glad we didn't get them. Um, but yeah, it really comes down to like finding the right location, and uh, then negotiating the right lease. I was just going to ask that. <laughs> Did you have experience negotiating leases prior to that, or? Uh, you know, we we had seen them, but that was a new experience for us. Uh, you know, a bit of unsolicited advice. You know, whatever you negotiate, negotiate in the LOI, letter of intent. Um, negotiate the LOI, don't wait for the lease to uh, negotiate whatever you want. You know, get a good mortgage, uh, or get a good uh, commercial realtor, and let them really ask for everything you want in that original LOI. And it all goes from there with the, uh, if it's all just word of mouth, or uh, you know, the, the landlord is, is giving you his word, it's, it's not gonna be in your lease. What are some of the, I guess, uh Looking into like if you were to open another Navigator tap room, what are some uh, I guess uh, some things that you would go into the next lease negotiation with that you'd like to you know you wouldn't make a deal or a long term lease with them if you didn't get X. Yeah, just you know uh, TI money, um, you know tenant improvement money is is important. If you can get that, uh, ask for the world in a market where the landlords are motivated to get a good tenant like this that's you know, tech savvy and, and fun and uh, 
will work for his location or her location, then, you know, ask for a TI budget. Ask for a abbreviated rent. You know, you shouldn't be paying rent while you're in construction. So, you know, get six to nine, 12 months abbreviated rent. Don't just settle for two months or three months. You know, ask for more TI money that you uh, would just accept if you didn't know them. And then, uh Yes, any, any questions so far? I feel like I'm... Have you experienced any other problems with any of the other businesses in the area, like not wanting you here or...? No, no. not at all. <laughs> yeah. uh, so when you when you and Eric were, you know, you'd gotten past the, we had a good conversation, we this is a good idea, to putting the business plan together, uh, at what point did you, I guess, start putting together how much capital it would take to open up a location? Um, you know, it, it was such a process to, you know, originally we were looking at doing a brewer, you know, we talked about doing a dive bar, like, not that we wanted to do that, but just, you know, what would work in Logan Square. Uh, there's a lot of breweries out there, so we decided that's too saturated of the market, high upfront cost to enter. And uh, so, you know, we started looking at uh, various business plans that we could find, brew pubs, breweries, you know, self-port tap rooms, whatnot. Um, and we really felt like, okay, self-port tap rooms is the most straightforward. Uh, it has, you know, the most um, just consistency in its, in, in its uh, cost model. Was it a lower uh, amount that you, you would need to raise than a, I guess, traditional bar? Yeah, because a, a lot of bars are going to have a kitchen. That kitchen, the black iron cost, all of that, brew, if you're a brew pub, all that equipment just really skyrockets the, the upfront start. So, um, you know, we, we just, I mean, it took us a good year to really just go from, hey, we should do something. Let's do a brewery. No, right. let's do a brew pub. No, let's do a self-port taproom and a nano brewery. You know, there's a couple versions of it to let's do self-port taproom, you know. But this was a, a time period in where there weren't too many, there weren't many uh, you know, so it was truly a new idea. And, uh, uh, now, I was talking too much, so you might, might get this. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, just, uh, with, with, uh, Logan Square, you know, as Tim said, it's a pretty heavily dense area, so you have Logan Square, you know, Bucktown, and, and, you know, uh, Wicker Park, and what I think is really, uh, a testament to what, what they built here is, and I was talking to Jody and them about, your personality is, is built into the, uh, the the venue, so you have Navigator Tap Room, and then you know about a mile down the road you have Tapster, and you know Tim and Roman, you know two owners, they, they have a great relationship uh, because they're two different locations. It's a lot of people think like, oh, there, well, there's already a self pour bar in Chicago, so, but that's not the case at all. It's been you know, it's been exciting to see not just you and Roman become you know better friends through the process, but to see both of their businesses do very well um, because they. They're offering two very different things. You know, while self poor taps are part of the equation, it's not the, the total experience. Um, and then, as far as like you know, when you when you did put together the business plan and how much you needed to raise, uh, did you did you underestimate how much you needed to raise to get open, or did you overestimate? Um, you know, I mean, in the end, you know, you're going to need a half a million. You know, on average, any location to do it right. Um, you know, you could do some of the work yourself, bring that down. You could, you know, streamline it in certain ways during construction, bring that down. But, you know, that's the range, up to half a million. And we knew that. Um, but, you know, just putting all that into the spreadsheet, all the costs, everything, um, you know, we did. We had a couple versions, light, medium, shoot for the stars, do everything how we really, really want it. And in the end, you know, for us, it was difficult to raise that kind of money. It wasn't just like, oh yeah, you know, just um, just come up with it overnight. And so that forced us actually to every single purchase and every single line item, we did everything we could to get it down to the bare minimum. If we had had a million dollar credit line and just spend, 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 everything's got to be excellent and perfect, we would have spent double. Um, so it, it actually forced us 
into a situation where we learned a ton about uh, budgeting, making sure we were raise or raise or thin on our cost. Where are some areas, I mean, because I, I love the open kind of like, uh, ceiling aspect of it, sure. but where are some of the areas where you maybe could point out where you were able to either save a significant amount, you know, than, than you, what you would have spent if you had done it a different way? Yeah, I mean, you know, everything that's painted, I personally painted myself. Um, that took me unknown amounts of hours until 4 a.m. Most nights, Duncan came and visited me. <laughs> um, you know, anything wiring that you see, any wiring, my business partner uh, did. You know, all the TVs, everything he installed himself. You know, all those things that we did ourselves, thank God we had a contractor that would allow that. It saved us uh, tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, you know, so that was, that was massive. And we really got to infuse into our space you know, our DNA, that's our, yeah. who we are, so, yeah. What kind of advertising So, we, we rolled out a six month marketing plan leading up to launch, got on all the e-magazines, got in the newspapers that were coming to town, hey, the week, you know, that month of launch, we were able to get on TV, new, you know, updated e-magazine, updated, you know, tri Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sometimes. Times, all the, you know, we did every, I contacted every single outlet possible. Uh, we got some luck and got on WGN TV and CBS News, which was amazing. So our, our marketing plan leading up to launch went as well as it possibly could. There was a lot of buzz because of the technology. And you can have that too in your own market because you'll probably be the first one. And it's okay if you're not. You don't have to be the only one, or, you know, to thrive. You can, I could drop five to ten of these in the Chicago land market and none of them would be competing with other cell core tap rooms in a head-to-head. -head. I mean, Tapster's a mile away and it, it's not a thing. Yeah. It's, uh, one of the things that I think, uh, and I guess if, if you were to go back and give yourself a talk two and a half years ago, uh, things that you've learned over the two and a half years, are there like three or four key things that you would say, you know, Tim, don't do this, Tim, do that. Like, are there are there things that you learned that you wish you could tell yourself from back then? Uh, you know, I mean, I worked every hour for like six months for seven days a week. You know, I wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> you know, that was crazy. <laughs> I don't even know how I did it, but it was pure adrenaline because we had to make it work and make sure that it was successful. You know, so I wouldn't do that again. I couldn't do that again. I don't recommend you do that. Just. <laughs> <laughs> hire your weaknesses from the beginning with good people and you know if you can have a shift supervisor from the beginning or a manager not just you uh, that'd be great um, you know uh, I did everything for that first year and uh, it was it was a lot and your first year you were you had much longer hours too right been, no it's always been you know four to midnight during the week and then uh, on weekends noon to 2 a.m. okay we thought about staying open until 2 a.m. every night, and luckily my business partner was like, two. <laughs> so. But yeah, because you can look at the revenue you get between 12 and 2, and if it's not, it doesn't make sense, you just yeah. don't do it, so. Um, I, think the, uh, I guess with, uh, when you were uh, picking out, you know, kind of the, I guess, the installation side of it, so uh, we have a micromatic system here. This is, uh, you know, one of the things I recommend everyone do is become familiar with the types of beer systems. Almost even uh, if you can go to like a beer school or just, you know, Micromatic has certified installers in every market, you could just go along with them for a day and, and learn about beer systems. Uh, while you're here, Tim hopefully will give you a little look at the back, but the cooler is directly behind here. But there's two types of beer systems there's direct draw and long draw. Uh, direct draw means that the, the faucet literally pokes into the cooler and that's, that's your beer system. That's how the beer stays cold. Uh, long draw, they use something called glycol, it's kind of like an antifreeze, and it, it, it chills the line the entire way, and this whole block, this is a Kronos uh, tower, uh, that whole area is, is constantly being circulated with glycol, actually. Uh, we have Pat, uh, who's the Micromatic uh, Director of this area, uh, here as well, so if, uh, if any of you have any, you know, more in-depth questions about that, or Pat, if you wanted to add a little bit more about the Kronos technology. You're, you're giving 
your right eye right now. So I'll, All right, I'll, I'll contact Kian yeah. for a position after. <laughs> yes. uh, all right. Talk to me afterward. By all means, I'm here for you guys. Today. So thanks for inviting me. There, no problem. Yeah, I mean, you know, I can't, I cannot stress enough how important it is for the cooler to be uh, fail safe. And that's what you get when you pay for Micromatic and a verified Micromatic installer. I have talked to business owners that had a refrigeration guy or a cousin who knew about coolers install their cooler and their taps and had utter nightmares. Um, and horrible customer experience, tons of foam, uh, condensers breaking down, really unhappy customers, horrible reviews online. And then in the end, they had to pay the piper, have it ripped out and put in professionally by a company on the level with Micromatic. Honestly, if, if, if you're considering installing a, a custom cooler with 30 to 48 taps, all that's gonna be one of your largest expenses in your startup. So. I would just go with Micromatic and their verified install. So that's my presentation right there, great. <laughs> <laughs> so then the key is, is that temperature too at 30 degrees. Uh, you don't want your your uh, clients to come in, or your clients, your home guests come in and have a foamy beer and bad experience. The most important thing is that 38 degree temperature. You hear that every time you talk about dress, it's 38 degrees. You go about a degree or two higher or lower than that, but that you need a lot to get 38 degrees. So this was all gravel and the windows were all, you know, papered up and uh, April 1st we started. It was a two and a half month window. June 17th we got everything done. That's when uh, the inspectors started coming through. And then we waited for that liquor license to be mailed to us. We launched that Friday, which turned out to be mid uh, July. So yeah, it was a three and a half month window. Good job. Wow, yeah. that's great. Yeah. That deserves an applause. Yeah, one, one of the funniest parts was uh, this was our first uh, large screen installation. And so this was a new development for our company. We were going from about a, a six inch screen to a nine inch screen. And Eric and, and uh, Tim were literally texting me daily, uh, what's the status of these screens? What's the status of these screens? I was like, I'm being told they're being shipped. We're, you know, we should be good. And they literally arrived here. I think Duncan and Jason and everyone we just started, and even uh, Eric started installing them as, as soon as they got in. So we didn't, we didn't hold, we, we met our kind of deadline, but it was, it was a little stressful. But uh, this guy stayed as cool as anyone I've ever seen under pressure. He was like, I trust you, I trust you. I was like, all right. Well, Funny oh man! I have to ask, what kind of struggles did you come across as far as the self courses? I have to ask, like just as far as guest experience, um, you know, with people not being familiar with, with that. Yeah, I, I mean, mean you know, know, when we launched, you know, there uh, was more people who'd never had a self port right. experience. So you just have to get them to the wall. You can't explain it verbally over at the front door. You gotta get them here and show them how to use it. It takes about a minute and a half. But within two to three minutes, they're pouring. Like you just have to verbally give them the tour, um, and then they're set for life. They can come in here every other day, and they don't need you to give that tour. So um, there is a bit of uh, anxiety for the customer who comes in, just sees a bunch of screens. They don't know anything about beer. They feel a little bit inferior or something. So you really need to lower that by just a smile. Hey, we're going to get you set up with a beer card. Just need your credit card and then I'll give it a tour here in a second. Then they're just like, they show up. Um, so. What was it like, if you had this experience, what was it like training the know-it-all employee? Um, the thing is, is that, I mean, you know, I recommend that you hire everyone. You don't just, I don't know, farm that out. You gotta get a sense for each person you're interviewing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a good uh, discerner of people. And so, if I even get that sense during an interview, I'm not gonna deal with that. I really haven't had that issue. But I know they're out there. They just don't work here. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you have any surprises with liquor losses taking maybe longer than you expected, or 
Uh, no, you know, the city of Chicago, um, surprisingly, is a pretty straightforward process when it comes to the liquor license. Uh, and we hired a liquor license lawyer to ensure there were no issues. Now we know we could do it on our own, not spend that extra line item, but uh, we pretty much had a 99% surety that we would get it, and we did. Like, there was no hope. How much did we get the roof loss as well? You know, it, they just have a flat, flat like $5,000 fee. Any aging problem with the beer? No, you know, that, that was a concern. We've never had a keg that turned skunky on our watch. Um, we have had kegs that are getting to the end of their dates and uh, tasting them ourselves. Customers had no problem with that taste. It didn't uh, become bad. What is the normal way? Um, you know, I think they give it a 90-day window once uh, it's in the distributor. It's got to be on tap by then. Are you doing anything if they are getting close to that age? Promoting that particular beer. Yeah, like we drop, like we've had to drop it down like twice in two years. Just set up forty cents an ounce, we'll bring it down to twenty-five cents an ounce. We'll put out, you know, um, one of those black markers above it, saying, you know, best, you know, biggest bang for your buck. Maybe an e even a bigger like handwritten sign saying, uh, blow out the keg deal, and people just run through it. Yeah. One of the things uh, I forgot to say about Micromatic is uh, they did a survey of uh, you know, rating customers' experience. And uh, if you actually just deliver what you say you're going to deliver, they typically get like a 96, 97 rating. But then when something goes wrong and then they fix it, then usually it ends up being like a 99 or 100 rating. And I'm not throwing Micromatic under the bus. In fact, I'm uh, shining a spotlight. Uh, one of the four or five trays came with a different cut. Uh, they installed it, you remember this. Sure. Uh, Stuber Sons installed it, didn't impact the business at all, but it was only off by like an inch or two, and they replaced everything at no additional cost to Tim, and no, so it's, I thought that was a, you know, something to point out where it's like, it, it was, this is their baby, and their baby came out and was, had one of their, their uh, you know, the, the sections off, and they came and just replaced it at no, no cost to Tim. Micromatic turned it around in like a, a few days or something like that, and it was, a, it was a really, I thought it was a good example of you know, it's not just, you know, delivering a perfect experience, but even if something ever did go wrong, it's about fixing that, you know, when it, when it doesn't go wrong, so. Yeah, they flew in a specialist from somewhere <laughs> in Texas, and they, yeah. they, like, took a, they took a cast of the whole thing. Yeah, it was <laughs> a pretty big deal. So, yeah, no, it was, uh, it was a cool one. I was impressed when I saw how quickly that got resolved, so another look there for Micromatic. Um, let's see, uh, one of the things I was talking about earlier is staffing. Um, you know, and, and we, that question was brought up as well. And I was saying I brought my, I have a 10 and 8 year old, and I brought him here after a Cubs game, and it was packed. Like every seat was packed. There was additional people standing up, and the wall looked was pretty empty. It had maybe one or two people at the wall pouring, but everyone's glasses were full. And I was standing over in that corner, and I, I, I was just smiling. My wife was like, "Why are you smiling?" I was like, "Because this is this is it. This is why this exists. You know, there's no waiting." Like. Um, and then, you know, I also went to look to see how many staff he had, and I think at, the, at that, he only had like probably you plus maybe two other people, maybe? Um, yeah, on a weekday night, like a Wednesday, Thursday night, when we're packed like that, I'll have two employees myself. Right, so it's, you know, I think that in itself is, uh, you know, from a staffing perspective, it's, you know, I, I assume you'll you usually have them kind of scattered out, but then on the peak times, it's, you know, maybe you or a manager plus two additional, two additional right? Yeah, it's, um, you know, Friday, Saturday night, you can run tight, like, okay, hey, we're not busy tonight. I'm going to cut two people. That's just the industry. They expect to be cut if it's slow. Some of them want to go home, you know. So you, you get a, a sense for your schedule, and then you run light when you can, and you staff heavy so it's the floor is covered and the customer experience is positive, you know. The whole, like, I'll have 200 people in here and I have one person over there and one person at the bar, um, it doesn't work. If people are having bad experiences because they can't get reactivated, they got foam on because they don't know how to pour because no one told them. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, no, it's, a lot yeah. of that stuff is just kind of ingrained in your head now. But you know, just yeah. even where, no matter where I'm at, if I see someone not open the tap the whole way and they get foam, it 
I have to go in and kind sure. of yeah, be there. Yeah, you get sucked in. But then, uh, and Micromatic also created a, a, a tap, it's called the Trigger Tap. And essentially it's an either all the way on or all the way off tap, which we always recommend. It just reduces people not pouring properly. Um, but on the untap thing, I, I, I like that too is uh, what happens when you get a gust that comes in, they're afraid to open that faucet. It opens a little bit. What happens is it creates agitation. What that agitation happens, what happens to that agitation, it breaks the CO2 out of solution, kind of going down to some physics here. And yes, there is physics in draft beer, so those physics classes. Your hand and colleague in high school come back now in your favor. Uh, but it'll agitate uh, the CO2 uh, in the beer and causes foaming. And then again, we'll give an unpleasant experience for that gas. I don't want to pay for foam, that kind of thing. So as you just mentioned, it's either on or off, so it takes the user air out of it. Yep. Yeah, that's a trigger tap. It's either on or off. It's spring loading. So that, like, you know, if you notice, there's, um, well, Usually there's sweating up to the tap. That's glycol chilled all the way. You don't have to do that, but it makes sure that your line is cold all the way to the person pouring. And then uh, also just heavier tap handles. That's real metal, right? Uh, not the plastic painted chrome. Uh, it's a total different feel, yeah. and it helps the customer with, with the trigger tap. All that, all that combined, uh, pretty much means that. Uh, most customers with a micromatic system are going to pour really well. You still need your staff to show how. Right. We always suggest having the staff help them pour their first year. And I, I even notice that sometimes I'll come in and it'll be a new employee and they don't know that I work with pouring beer. And I just want to get the experience and like consistently every time I come in, the staff will take me from the check-in, let me help you pour your first beer, and I'm like, they're, they're doing great, you know. Just those little things really do make a big difference because a lot of times it is that person's first time ever doing that, um, and you want that first experience to be a good one. So, uh, but one of the things I was going to say is uh, with Untapped, you know, when we first built the system, every beer that had to be put in had to be hand put in. So, uh, I, Tim probably remembers this too. You had to find the image on Google Images, and you had to find the ABV and the IBU and the tasting notes and Every single beer had to be hand built into the to the Pour My Beer database for every single location, and you know I'm a I'm a fan of uh, the, the concept of one plus one equals three. So it might take two hours to or more to do a 50 tap lineup if you were changing you know all 50 beers or even 20 it might take an hour, um, and that's just a waste of time. So what I did is I I, I kind of uh, reached out to Untapped. I was like, you guys have a million and a half beers. Uh, you know, I love what you guys are doing with digital signage. We're, we're growing and I kind of sold them on what we were doing and I said, can we connect our system so when they update their untapped system, it just, you know, autonomously flows to our system so we can grab the image, the ABV, the IBU, the tasting notes, and uh, we did it. Uh, so, you know, when, when Tim updates his untapped account, what it does is it sends all the beers to the screens, not to update, like say, tap 19. If he, if he updated tap 19 and, and uh, untapped, he just put his administrator card on there and then picked the beer that he just put on, on that, but it's already pushed the update to the screen. So, you know, as a company, we always want to be mindful that, you know, your time is very valuable and we don't want you to have to, you know, update uh, this system there and on our system. Or more importantly, if, if we became the police and we owned the beer database, and if you wanted to put some like limited release in there, we still give you the ability to put custom images in there. Like Tim could put his face on one that was a collaborative beer, you know. And when someone goes up to it, which I highly recommend, you know, <laughs> the beer and everything, uh, like a meme. You know? um, but you can you can have fun with it. And we also made it so when you hit your limit, uh, you can change the the message that is, is communicated to the customer instead of saying, you know, you hit your responsibility limit. Uh, the default one that I put in there is you're beautiful. Hope you're having a great time. Please see one of our friendly staff to reauthorize your card. So it's it's all about kind of putting that personality into the technology, but it's your personality. Um, so any any part of the system we we see an opportunity to kind of improve on and make it better, we we do it. And, and I, I was saying earlier we're we're on version 28 of our software, and you know really it's only like four years old. Um, so you know a lot of companies they do like one release every quarter. So that'd be like 16 releases over that time. So we always want to continue to, to, to make our product better. We, we're releasing happy hour functionality now where when you set your happy hours on untapped, it automatically flows to our system. 
Um, another feature is keg level uh, you know, management, so you can get alerts when a keg hits a certain threshold. Uh, you can see the born on date of the kegs. All these things, they weren't there you know, two and a half years ago, or even like, some of them not even like now. Uh, we haven't pushed the update to Tim yet. But you know, our goal is that we fully test it before we ever release anything, because the last thing we would ever want to do is push an update and then something's not working. Um, but yeah, I mean, for us, we, we've stayed behind a couple of generations behind on the uh, updates, just because the system's working perfect for us, and we don't want to uh, mess with that, because we're super cautious and paranoid. That's our uh, shtick, it's what we deal with, but um, how Josh is running Pour My Beer, they're constantly trying to innovate, and so we kind of like, we try to be six months to 12 months behind <laughs> on the updates, see how it goes. See, when you're starting a new tap room, you can come in on a new version or new update, and it's just, this is what it is. Uh, for us, you know, we're two and a half years, so like we're just, you know, we're plodding along on the updates, yeah. you know? No, that's fine. We don't force people to take the updates. Right. Uh, that's, we, and that's a beautiful thing. You guys aren't like, no, you have to update. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, questions? So back to the personnel. I assume there's no tipping involved, so are most of these people on regular uh, we, wages rather than serving wages? Basically, uh, we pay them uh, an hourly wage, which is above minimum wage for tipped employees. They have, you could do no tips and just pay them uh, double that or, or more, but uh, they are tipped and it's about, you know, people tip at a 15% rate when they... Uh, more of the people tipping. Uh, they're, they're tipping the staff and that goes directly to them. But how, what, what is the interaction that's causing that tip? Uh, like our staff like constantly interacts with our customers uh, at the front desk a couple times up here at the beer wall and uh, basically creates a warm welcome hospitable environment for the, the groups to have fun with their birthday parties at the Rose and just have a great time so people are trained because of Starbucks and all the other iPads out there when people check out Square and whatnot to tip but then our staff actually does a great job of serving the, the people that are Yes, pouring their own beer, but they're also, uh, you know, we have a bar. We're constantly bringing them, you know, snacks, smiling, giving them a, 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 a free swag and giveaways. So, like, the customer base is happy to tip our staff, and they've earned it. Okay. Another question. Tell me what you want on this one. You got 48 here. What kind of revenue do you feel like a bar like this has to do to? Warrant having 48 Um, you know, basically, uh, it, it's not based on the amount of taps because you know this model you have a a much faster ROI. Um, your costs are gonna you're gonna break even that first year, year and a half, two years max. So, you know, if you've picked a good location and you got a good market, which I'm sure everyone in here is from a market where there's beer lovers and craft uh, beer enthusiasts, like the number of taps really doesn't matter. We, we would have liked to do more. It just meant, would have meant a much larger cooler for um, the space we could get. So I'm just in a much smaller market. That's sure. So I'm trying to figure out, all right, here's what I think I could do revenue wise. Yeah. But how many taps should I have to justify mm. that? I'd, I'd be happy to like talk to you about your market and square footage afterwards. I, I would say that if you're in a smaller market, that 30 to 40 is perfect. Um, Josh has seen a, a hundred of these places around the country, so he could weigh in. But like, you know, basically what I want to say to you is, you know, we were thinking 60, 88. We're so glad we didn't do that. Um, just because the number of kegs you'd have to have in there, then we would be hitting kegs that are going to get a warrant. And storage for all the empty kegs. It's not like these trucks come every day to pick them up. So it starts to take up all your storage in the back. So 48 was a sweet spot for us. Um, my brother Dan opened one in Durham, North Carolina, 64. It's a lot. And uh, you know, also, I would say, um, you know, your cost for that 30 taps or 36, 40 taps, it's going to pay for itself very quickly. 
Oh, just for uh, example, Highland, uh, Highland, Indiana, it's a pretty small market, it's near Munster. Um, they've got a 20 tap system, and uh, he added like, I think, six more like two years later. But they, I mean, they that's more than enough for his market, and it's a pretty yeah. small it, space, it's much smaller than this, but it, it does really well. Um, Tanya, I gotta take what's a, a small break. market. Is that, it's because we went somewhere where they said they were a small market, and we thought we were a small market. In it. So I'm just curious what a small market means. Small like market? Uh, I mean, I would say just uh, you look at how much traffic's going back and forth, you know, in front of your place. Or, your, I mean, like, do you know the uh, the population in, in Logan Square? Yeah, we did, a, we did a triangulated, you know. So, what, like, what, do you do it within a mile, or do you do it within, like, a half a mile, or what do you? We did it within two miles. Two miles? So, what was it, like, a few hundred thousand, or? Um, you know, I, I can't remember what it was when we, when we searched it, but it was hundreds of thousands here. Okay. But, uh, you know, it's Chicago. It's just, uh, any, 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 uh, small to mid market can handle one of these. For yeah, sure. yeah. So, no, that's, uh, well, he, Tim's got a, uh, a bunch of kegs being delivered. Yeah. Doesn't mean he's done for the day. Yeah, yeah. I just gotta uh, go. But he's gotta go do some signing. I'm, I'm happy to answer. Before he does that, can everybody give him, please, yes. a huge round of applause?